Good morning. I'm internet sensation and teen heartthrob Jared Spool. <laughs> and I want to talk about what was probably the biggest, most important project that's been done in the field of UX ever. A project that had an investment of about 8 billion kroners. Uh, but hardly anybody talks about it. It's actually a wearable product, and what's weird about it is it doesn't measure how far you walk, it doesn't measure what your heartbeat is, it doesn't let you tap it and then vibrate somebody else's phone, it doesn't even tell the time, which is weird because the company that made it is actually sort of famous for their watches, and it only works in three cities in the world. Shanghai, Anaheim, California, and Orlando, Florida. And that is the Disney Magic Band, for which Disney spent a billion dollars, and its only purpose is to improve the user experience of the park. That's all it does. And what's interesting about the Magic Band is just how thoroughly designed this thing is. You get it in these beautiful boxes that have every family member's name. Each band is personalized to the family member. Inside each band are three radio transmitters, a GPS transmitter, a uh, NFC transmitter and a Bluetooth low frequency transmitter. And those transmitters allow you to open the doors of your hotel room the moment you arrive. They allow you to get VIP access to the rides in the park. They allow you to purchase things anywhere in the park, even if you didn't intend to. And if your child has their birthday while they're visiting the park, which is fairly common, their favorite character will actually seek them out and wish them a happy birthday based on the GPS locator. It's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's cool. If we've learned anything in the last five years, it's that uh, Uber has taught us that things that are a little creepy can be cool. <laughs> this cost Disney a billion dollars. It took them seven years from the start of the project to finish. It was two years overdue. And it is probably the most expensive UX project that's ever been done. And yet, we don't talk about it. And it's really important that we do, because there's a lot of lessons to learn. To learn the first lesson, we have to go all the way back to 1997, because the team that built that magic band was the Disney Parks and Resorts team. And they were the team that rolled out Disney's first website. This ugly piece of crap. This website was so difficult to use, so hard, that we actually started using it as a training tool for basic usability testing. When we were trying to teach teams how to do usability tests, we would actually bring up this website and give them things to test. Because you couldn't go for about more than two minutes without running into a major usability problem which is perfect when you're training people to be good usability test moderators. And we had all sorts of tricks that we used to use. One of my favorites 
was a task that we did that was based on a, a, a real piece of research that we'd done. We had, we had, had a, a mother of a six-year-old come in and she told us that her six-year-old loved trains and she wanted to stay somewhere in Walt Disney World so that she could take the monorail every day, everywhere. So she needed to find a hotel that was on the monorail. But she was a single mom, she didn't have a lot of money, and she didn't want to spend a lot of money. So, so she was trying to figure out, how do you figure out what is the cheapest hotel on the monorail at Walt Disney World? So that became our sort of test task. And we would, we would have people who were practicing usability testing actually have people try this task. Because it turned out it was really hard. It shouldn't be hard. There's only three hotels on the monorail at Walt Disney World. There are 24 hotels, but there are only three of them on the monorail. And two of them are really expensive. The third one is the Polynesian Resort. That's the answer, right? So should be able to figure it out in a minute, two minutes. Almost never happened. In fact, we ended up doing this task hundreds of times because we kept training people with it. And what we found was, was that out of every 100 users, only 10 would succeed. 90 would never figure out that the Polynesian Resort was the right hotel. And of those 90, 20 would accidentally choose a hotel in Disneyland. Now, for those of you who haven't become intimately familiar with the Disney world, Disneyland and Disney World are very different places. I know it's a little confusing, world, land, land, world. What's the difference? Well, for one thing, about 4,800 kilometers. <laughs> and to make sure that this wasn't just a, a simple mistake and that they really meant one or the other, we would actually watch them complete the task. And they would almost always find the contemporary resort in Disneyland, because not only is it the only hotel on the monorail at Disneyland, but at the time, it was the only hotel at Disneyland. They would find it and they'd say, okay, I'm done. And what we would train the moderators to do, because this is what you do in user research, you, you do follow up to make sure you understand what the problem is. We would ask the, have, them, have them ask another probing question to see if they could figure out what it was. And the probing question we would teach them to ask is, can you take the monorail from that hotel to Epcot Center, which is one of the theme parks inside Disney World? And inevitably, the user in our studies, the participant, would turn back to the computer and they'd click around for a moment. They'd decide that they have the answer and they'd turn back to the moderator and they would say, yes. Yes, you can. The monorail is a six car train that travels at about uh, 60 kilometers per hour for 4,800 kilometers with no bathroom. You're not taking the monorail from that hotel to Epcot. But the users were convinced they were. And this happened time and time again. And we knew that this was such a problem that uh, 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 I would go and, and talk to folks and I would give talks and I would explain this story and people would think this is very amusing. And then one time I was giving a talk and this woman comes up to the stage after my presentation while I'm packing up my computer. And, she, sa and she, she says, I need to tell you something. And I look at her badge and it says Walt Disney World Parks and Resorts. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, I'm gonna get in trouble now. And she says, you can't tell anyone. I'm like, okay. She says, this happens all the time. People show up in Florida with California hotel reservations all the time.
turns out that this was such a big problem that the Disney Corporation, in their desire to always deliver a great customer experience, would reserve rooms <laughs> solely for the purpose of people who show up at the wrong resort. Millions of dollars of rooms were reserved. Okay. I'm going to repeat this. Millions of dollars were, even in their busiest season when they're all sold out, they still had empty rooms waiting for people who show up with the wrong reservation. Imagine a world where a corporation keeps millions of dollars of inventory aside because it's easier than fixing the damn website. That was 1997. And here we are in 2014 with a billion dollar project that changed the way we think about design. How did Disney, in particular Disney Parks and Resorts, get from that world where they seemed absolutely clueless about how to build a simple website to a place where they have one of the most significant wearables service design projects on the planet? Well, to understand how they learned this, we first have to understand how we understand. It turns out that when we go to learn something new, no matter what it is, whether we're learning to cook, whether we're learning a language, whether we're learning to play an instrument, whether we're learning how to do design, we always start in the same place. We start in a place that's called unconscious incompetence. Unconscious incompetence is a stage that we go through where we are, in fact, completely incompetent. And it makes sense. We've never done this before. Of course we're incompetent at it. Because we're incompetent at it, we don't do a good job. But the other problem with this stage is we are unconscious about that. We are completely unaware that we haven't done a good job. From our perspective, it's pretty awesome. After all, yesterday we couldn't do it at all, today we did it, how awesome is that? And you've all known people going through this stage, you've had their food, you've tried to talk to them in a new language, you've listened to them play an instrument, it's painful. And so, Unconscious incompetence is this stage that everybody goes through. And usually what happens is, assuming you have a good friend, they take you aside and they say, please stop. Don't do this anymore. You're not very good at this. And at that moment, we learn the difference between good and poor quality and we discover that what we're doing is poor quality. And we then enter the stage of conscious incompetence. Conscious incompetence is when we are still bad at it. We haven't learned how to do it well. But, in fact, we now know we're bad at it. We can see what good is, but we can't get there ourselves. And this can be a very depressing place. Conscious, unconscious incompetence is very blissful. We're very happy. Suddenly, during conscious incompetence, we are not happy at all. But this changes. For those people who don't give up, most people give up, but those people who don't give up, they persist. They start to learn how the basics work. They learn the recipes, they learn the grammar, they learn the elements. And as a result, they then move to the next stage of conscious competence. Because at this point, they can start to build something, make something, cook something, play something. They can do all the things 
if they just follow the recipe, follow the music, follow the, the exact instructions, they follow all of that and they are now consciously competent. Now, this stage ends when they keep practicing, when they keep learning, and suddenly they find that they no longer need that recipe, they no longer need that translation book, they no longer need to think about where their fingers are on the instrument. They can start by just doing it. And at that point, they become unconsciously competent. They are now capable of doing what they need without those assistance tools. Now, the transition between unconscious incompetence and conscious incompetence, we call literacy. Because what we're learning is the basic grammar. We're learning the difference between good and bad. We're learning what the vocabulary is, what the elements are, what the basic materials are. We're just learning these things. We don't know how to use them effectively, but we are learning that they are all parts of the bigger whole. When we transition from conscious incompetence to conscious competence, we call that fluency. Now we're learning how to construct sentences. We're learning how to make meals. We're learning how to play songs. And when we move from conscious competence to unconscious competence, that is what we call mastery. Now what we're doing is we are mastering our craft. We're learning how to combine things in unique ways. We're learning how to solve problems that we've never encountered before for which we don't have a recipe handy. And it's these three stages that we go through to learn something. And the team at Disney had to go through these stages. But Disney is not a person. Disney is an organization. And organizations have a slightly different path. Organizations go through their own path. And it starts with the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages is when nobody is thinking about design. It's not on anybody's radar. It never occurred to anybody that they should think about design. They're completely unconsciously incompetent about it. And they just put out whatever they put out, and it doesn't matter. What often happens, though, is that suddenly someone comes on board who actually knows something about design. They hire somebody or someone reads a book or something, and now design, they're aware of this. And at that point, they enter a stage we call spot UX design. And in spot UX design, there's a project here or maybe a project there that actually is about making some aspect of what we do better. And that project often gets great acclaim. People look and go, oh, that's really cool. Like, we should do more of this. Yes, we should. But often we don't do more of that because the organization as a whole doesn't know what they're doing. And as a result, the way they used to do things just subsumes them. And oftentimes the person who was the instigator of that ends up leaving out of frustration. And that's the end of that. But for some organizations, someone in the executive team, someone with a lot of role power and influence will decide, you know, this UX thing we need to start investing in this. And at that point, we create what's called UX design as a service. And this is what happens when you start to create a design team. And the design team starts to grow. And it gets funding. And it gets attention. And people start using it. And if it gets really good, it starts to get very big. And it's helping all different parts of the company. And for the longest time, we thought this was the end game. This was the best we could do. We're going to create a massive design team, and we're going to give whoever the leader is a seat at the table. I don't know what table they think they're going to sit at, 
It probably has Herman Miller chairs. As far as I can tell, a seat at the table just means more staff meetings. <laughs> but we're going to do that. But it turns out this isn't the end goal. Because if you do really well at this, the teams you're working with actually want to stop working with you. Because what they want is their own designers. They want their own people on their team. They're tired of hiring this centralized team and bringing them in and trying to get their hours and having a new person get swapped in every six months and losing all that institutional memory. They're tired of all of that. They want to have their own designers. And now we've entered the stage of embedded UX design. And in embedded UX design, we are now at the point where we can uh, uh, give a team full attention all the time. And we thought for a while this was the end game. This was the farthest we were going to go. But it turns out that there's one more stage. And that happens when the people on the team, the people who we consider to be not the designers, start to make design decisions. And they make them really smartly. Because they've been hanging around the designers enough that they have started to become literate and now fluent in design. And the developers and the product managers and the stakeholders and the executives and even the people from legal and compliance and regulation are now helping us make better designs instead of just making decisions that don't think about the user at all. And that stage is called infused UX design. And infused UX design is the stage where everybody in the organization is now capable of making smart design decisions. Decisions that are more likely to end up with a delighted customer than a frustrated customer. I noticed a lot of you are taking pictures. If you're posting this on Twitter, please do. I'll even pose. <laughs> Otherwise, if you watch later in the day, I'll post the slides. You can have all these. You don't have to eat up your pixels. <laughs> Though they're cheap. OK. These are the stages. And our friends at Disney in 1997, they were back here at the Dark Ages. 2014, they'd work their way up to infused design. That's the journey that they went on. That's the journey that your organization can go on. You're probably already on your way. And if it feels like it's taking a long time, that's okay. It took Disney 17 years. If you are doing it in less than 17 years, you're actually better than them. Now here's the thing. Disney's an organization, and we're talking about a whole organization, but it turns out that maturity scale, it's actually not about the organization, because organizations are made of teams. And each team in the organization actually lives at a different point on that scale. Some teams are more uh, mature than others. And the teams that are more mature understand the value of design, understand how to use design to produce competitive products and services. They understand more. The teams that are less mature, they're struggling with design. They're just trying to get their products out. They don't get it. And my guess is within your organization, you can imagine which teams are which. You have no trouble figuring this out. But here's the thing. Teams 
Turns out, they're made of people. It's like Soylent Green. At some point, everything's made of people. Here's the deal. It's not just any people. Teams are made up of people who are having an influence over the design, whether they have the title of designer or not. We call those people influencers. And those influencers are affecting the user's experience. If they understand design, if they're fluent in design, they will do a better job of affecting the user's experience than if they are not. So those influencers are gonna be at different points. While we as designers may find ourselves comfortable in the design as a service, people we work with who have influence over what we do find themselves in other places. Some of them as far back as the dark ages where they don't understand design at all. And that's how it works. And you're faced with people who are making decisions. Do they do this or do they do that? And because they can't see the difference between good and bad design, to them they seem the same from that perspective. They can see this one is faster, this one will take longer and be more expensive. Why wouldn't we pick the faster, cheaper one? They can't see the difference. So our job as design leaders, and everybody in this room is a design leader, is to actually help identify the least mature person on the team. Because it turns out, if we want to say where the team is, it turns out that it's not where the most mature person is. It's not where the average maturity of the team is. The team's maturity is based on the least mature person on the team who has influence over the design. That least mature person is the one who will drag the rest of the team down. I'm sure you've all had the experience of having someone on the team who doesn't get it and everybody has to slow down in order to make them understand and help them get through it. So as design leaders, our job becomes getting those people to be literate and then fluent. That's our number one job. If you thought it was putting pixels on a screen, you were wrong. Anybody can do that. What we need is people to lead, to bring the team up. In 1953, a designer named Henry Dreyfus changed the way we thought about design with the invention of, of all things, a thermostat. This is the Honeywell H model thermostat, and it has been the most popular thermostat in the world. You guys use thermostats here, yes? No? Yes, no? Some, some of you do. <laughs> Thermo I, I have learned this. In the United States, we use this to control temperature. In Iceland, they look at this and they go, why would you use this? The ground just makes heat. <laughs> we boil water on the floor. <laughs> if you are in a house that has some sort of heating, it probably has a device much like this that lets you change the temperature. And this was the leading thermostat in the world. And, it, and it, what made it unique was its design. It was simple, it was, it was aesthetically pleasing. There were all sorts of great things about it. Henry Dreyfus created hundreds of models of this thing, and this is the one that they shipped, and this is the one that sold. It was, they sold millions of them. And then in 2011, a little startup called Nest came out 
with their version, and it changed everything. The Nest is digital. It has sensors in it. It can tell if you're in your house or not. It turns the heat down when you're not there. When you start walking around, it turns it back up. It learns your habits. It program, programs your heat based on how you live. It's a little creepy, but it's cool. <laughs> and the thing about the Nest is that it wasn't built by Honeywell. Honeywell owned this market, but why didn't they invent the nest? Why was it a startup that came up with this idea? This question bugged us for a really long time. And to understand this, we first have to understand how markets mature. And it turns out the way markets mature is that they also go through stages. The first stage is the technology stage. In the technology stage, you have a piece of hardware that people will pay almost anything for. This was a Motorola StarTAC 4000 phone. It cost uh, uh, $4,000, it weighed a kilo and a half, and uh, you had to shout in it to, uh, to work, and someone else had to have a matching one for it to be useful. And yet people paid that kind of money and they carried this large, heavy thing around because they wanted that phone. That's the technology stage. But at some point, a competitor comes in and now we move to the feature stage. And in the feature stage, we start to compete on all the different features for all the different things. And, we, and the way we compete is we keep adding features to the product. Feature, 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 feature. Right? We just keep adding them in. And we do that until there are no more features that anybody cares about. That's the moment that we get to. You know, this is the moment where we start adding talking paper clips to our word processors. And at this point, we are now in the experience stage. And we start to think about the experience of the device. We start to think about the experience of the thing we're building. The thing about this stage is it's often not the market leader who comes in. It's often somebody else. Someone who isn't burdened by selling on features, who can say, hey, I can deliver less features at a higher price because it's a better experience. And that's what happens. And then there's a fourth stage, which is when suddenly the product becomes bigger than something else. Nobody uses an iPhone for the phone anymore. It's not what anybody cares about. They use it for all the other things it can do. In fact, there's a whole generation of people who get really upset if you call them. They don't want to talk to you on the device they take with them everywhere. <laughs> and that's when we enter the commodity stage. And in the commodity stage, we don't care about the thing anymore. American Airlines just settled a suit for millions of dollars with a company called GoGo. You probably have no clue who GoGo is, but GoGo is the company that makes the Wi-Fi on the planes. And American Airlines sued them because they weren't fast enough. They had, American Airlines had signed a 10-year contract five years ago and in that five years, the competitors to GoGo -Go have gotten faster, and American Airlines wants to get out of their contract so they can switch to the competitor. The court threw out the case because you can't break a contract that you made for 10 years because you were stupid enough to sign a contract for Wi-Fi for 10 years. <laughs> but that's because they needed it. It was affecting Americans' business. 
customers were deciding which planes to fly based on how fast the Wi-Fi was. That's the commodity stage. Well, it turns out these stages map directly into the organizational maturity stage in that you cannot get to the experience and commodity stages until you have gotten close to being design infused. So how does this help us understand the nest? Why didn't Honeywell invent the nest? Well, it turns out that the original Henry Dreyfus thermostat, the H model, was definitely a technology solution. Whereas they then created features, but nobody could figure out how to use them, so they never took off. And Honeywell basically tanked in that market of anything other than that simple H model. The Nest was a new experience, and like most new experiences, it came from outside the industry, not from a company inside the industry. But this doesn't completely explain it. The H model was spot UX design. Honeywell had hired Henry Dreyfus. He came in, he built lots of prototypes. He, they found one they liked. They shipped it. And Henry Dreyfus went away. And Henry Dreyfus did what all good designers eventually do. He died. It's true. You watch. They will all do this. Honeywell had no design capability after he left, and definitely none after he died. So they had no ability to do this. The Nest, on the other hand, started at Design Infused. They started at that point. Now, there are those who say, well, okay, but Honeywell, they make lots of things. They weren't completely concerned with the uh, uh, thermostat business. Yes, that's true. How concerned weren't they? Well, it turns out Nest sold to Google for $3.2 billion. That's a lot of not concerned. But here's the thing. We thought that Nest started as Design Infused because they were a startup. At first, we thought that startups were this special magical thing. We thought of them as sort of like stem cells, right? Stem cells in the, in, in the human body start as these special cells, and then they become some other cells, right? As, you, as, the, as the human grows, they become liver cells, or they become nose cells, or they become colon cells. They just shift. And we thought, okay, maybe startups were like stem cells. If they're small enough, they, they, they start in this one state and then they become something else. And this theory made sense to us for lots of reasons, uh, including the fact that a lot of people who work at, at startups sometimes seem like colons. <laughs> Just saying. But it turns out that that's not the right theory. Here's really how Nest got to this state. It's simple. It was started by a guy named Tony Fidel. Tony Fidel was the lead designer at Apple on the iPod, the iPad, the iPhone. And the first thing he did was hire people from the team that created the iPod, the iPads, the iPhones. And everybody they hired was understood design. Everybody came out of that environment. They'd already gone through the maturity. They were all masters of design. So he just built a company that way. That's how they started Design Infused. Honeywell, on the other hand, was a typical company where everything was hard to do. And as a result, they were not Design Infused. They were not capable of making these designs. So Honeywell had the choice. If they wanted to be like Nest, they would either have to fire everybody and hire only people who understand design or train everybody in the organization. Both of those are expensive operations. There's one more thing, which is that we can have a product that works technically, meets business needs, but if it's not designed well, 
That's okay. We'll still ship it, and we'll fix it in the next release. Right? This happens all the time. Right? We know it's not designed well. We know this. But we got to get it out. We got to ship it. We got to make it happen. We'll fix it in the next release. I believe that's Microsoft's tagline. <laughs> but there's something that happens. We call it the UX tipping point. It's another inflection point. And this point happens when suddenly, if it works technically and meets business needs, and only if it's designed well, will we ship it. Only if it's delightful enough. Which means we have to understand what that means in our organization. And that turns out to be really hard. That's the tipping point. That's the end game. That's where we're trying to get to. How do we get there? We talk about design process all the time. We talk about process as if it's this thing that we just pull the ball back and let it go, and it just goes tink, tink, Think, and it just happens exactly the same way every time. We fixate on process. We talk about process. What is your process? In interviews, we ask candidates, what is your process? As if we care. Because it's not like we're going to let them use it anyways. We will barely let them use our process. We have process. Process always works the same. But this doesn't actually get product shipped. This is not how it works. Instead, as my friend Dan Maul likes to say, we have to think of it in terms of a system. This is a, a football pitch. And the thing about this is that it is adaptable to whatever situation we're at. There's a set of rules, we have to follow those rules, but what we do once we get on the field is completely adaptable. We don't come running onto the field with a giant Gantt chart that has swim lanes for every player saying exactly what minute they're gonna score in. That doesn't happen. What we do instead is we have a set of plays. We go out with a set of plays that we have practiced and depending on the situation, we adapt. And that's how we're, we work. We're supposed to adapt. And the way that we adapt is by taking plays. Now, we've compiled about 130 different plays that teams can use to become more design mature. Some of them are literacy plays, some of them are fluency plays, some of them are mastery plays. And we can start to look at what these plays are. So here's a couple that work really well a lot of the time. The first one is immersive exposure. This is a literacy play where what we do is we go out and really get to know our users by watching them use our products or our competitors' products. And chances are you've already done some of this. If you've done any amount of usability testing, you've started down this road. It's even better if you've gone into the field and met people and actually seen them work. Because now you get to see their context. You get to see what breaks when it's not inside your, your pristine lab. And what we've learned is, is that in order for immersive exposure to work, every influencer on the team needs a minimum of two hours every six weeks. Two hours of being exposed to real users. The teams that do this as a minimum are far more likely to produce better products and services than uh, teams that don't. And the reason this happens is because by sitting and watching users, you learn about design. You learn the difference between good design and bad design. You learn what changes you made work and what changes you made make things worse. And that process, 
makes you completely aware of the tools and the medium. It's the literacy of what you're doing. And we can map this out. We can take, for example, a, a journey of a customer. We can take the things that a customer does when using our product or service, we can put it on a scale from extreme frustration to extreme delight. And we can say, okay, those are the delightful bits, and then it gets frustrating, but then it gets more delightful, and then it gets more frustrating, and voila. We can map the experience a user has. We can start to manipulate the experience the user has by trying to improve each of these things. We can see if the frustration goes away, the delight comes in, and now we are making better designs. And we do that purely by watching, by being exposed to users immersively. That's immersive exposure. Another play that works really well is called a shared experience vision. And a shared experience vision is a more advanced thing. It's something that you do when you, both literacy and fluency. And what it does is it ha means that we have a common understanding of what the experience of using our product will be like five years from now. Not what the product will be five years from now, that we're not trying to predict, but what is the experience? And that experience is like having a flag in the sand. It's on the horizon, it's far away, it's gonna take us years to get there, but everybody can see it. And the rule is, since we all know where that flag is, march towards the flag. It doesn't matter where you are starting from, if you take baby steps towards the flag, eventually you will get to the flag and everybody converges. So having a solid vision, a single vision, of what the experience is going to be like of using our product in the future, five years from now, that's the vision. That's having that understanding. And we socialize it in the organization. We explain it. We use it to make every decision. We say, hey, which, we have two choices. Which one gets us closer to the vision? Right? We're now asking those people who may not understand design, which one gets us closer to the vision? We make that the priority. We, make that, we build that into our reward system. And that process is based on that journey map. Because what we can do is we can ask, what does it mean to make the whole thing delightful? How do we make delight all the way across? Imagine that experience that we have today in a form that's completely delightful. What would it be like? Tell me that story. Now, let's repeat that story so everybody understands it. Let's start taking baby steps towards that story. That's the vision. The last play that I'm going to share with you is called A Culture of Continuous Learning. And A Culture of Continuous Learning is something we use at every stage. The culture of continuous learning now helps us understand uh, uh, how to develop ourselves to make sure we're always learning how to be better at serving our customers and our users. We have this culture now where we're trying to get everybody to fail all the time. There are consultants who go around saying, you have to fail. If you're not failing, you're not good at what you do. Which I don't understand, because if you're good at failing, then you're failed. If you didn't fail because you were good, I don't get it. <laughs> this whole failing thing, I think, is miserable because, frankly, I know lots of people who seem to fail all the time and never learn a thing from it. Personally, I would rather learn, right? And if I have to learn through failure, that's fine. But if I can learn without failing, that's even better. We've started a school uh, for UX designers in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, part of this ritual of the school is every day the students come in and they have to go through a stand-up. And it's a normal stand-up. It has sort of questions that you ask at a normal stand-up. What do you accomplish? What are you going to accomplish? What's preventing you from getting things done? What's your highest priority? But then we've added a fifth question. 
And the fifth question is, what's the most important thing you've learned and how has it changed what you do in the future? And this question changes everything because every day the students and the faculty have to come in and talk about what they learned in the last 24 hours. And when we do this with teams, every member of the team now has to figure out what they've just learned something that they learned about. It's a type of reflection. And that type of reflection encourages the fact that we can learn from all different things. So that's the three plays. And if you do these things, you will be on your way to creating an amazing experience. An experience like the Magic Band, where the, a six-year-old comes into the park puts her wrist in front of the magic Mickey, and at that moment, a tone sounds, and all of the Disney cast members who are standing in a 15-foot radius of that person turns, looks at the kid, and says, happy birthday, Angela. That's cool. A little creepy, <laughs> but that's cool. And that's what I came to talk to you about. You want to make sure that you are growing from, and everybody around you is growing, from unconscious incompetence all the way to unconscious competence. Your organization needs to grow as your teams mature. You need to understand how that works. And finally, you need a playbook that is filled with plays that are going to get you there. That's what I came to talk to you about. Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. Thank you. Just enjoyable, right? <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Jared, for the starting of the conference in a great way. I was thinking, um, you're giving an approach to what happens when design uh, or when non-designers uh, become more fluently mm -hmm. at understanding how to work with design uh, and embed it. What's your approach or view on how we as designers can think about our role? I mean, will, will our role as designers change when others become more fluently? Oh yeah, we'll get way more holiday. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, <laughs> Right now, so many designers spend their days drawing the same dialog box in 17 different states to make sure that the developers don't screw up and they understand exactly what happens when the radio button is clicked and this field has to appear and what the validation on that field is going to be and, and how that cross validates with this field. And we spend our time working at those details. Imagine what would happen if suddenly we could draw on a whiteboard an idea for a dialog box and the developer would go, got it boss, I'll oh, have it for you in an hour. I would and they that. would get it because at that point we can start to work on the hard problems. We don't get to work on the hard problems because we have to do every dialog box in 17 states. And I personally would like to start working on the hard problems. So that's where we're going. Okay, so it's a great opportunity, <laughs> moving, <laughs> leveling yes, up. Yeah, exactly. I, it sounds like we can all recognize what you're talking about here. Uh, so would, we're going towards so. a bright future then. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, I'm from the United States, so anything would be a bright future <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, True that. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to put the symbol of Mordor on our license plate. <laughs> So, Jared, um, we're at the conference today, and hopefully, we are? yeah, <laughs> <Holy> <laughs> I think shit. we are a UX conference. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully, many of us will be pushing our boundaries somewhat today, learn something new, or at least become what you name um, consciously incompetent. No, I think we want to become consciously uh, 
consciously competent. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> but, Unconsciously but competent is what when, we want. I mean, some of us will probably mm. move into some uh, some kind yeah. of consciously incompetent phase. If we do that, mm -hmm. that's probably going to be a bit uncomfortable. You were saying you're, you're basically no, not I, happy uh, in that phase. Unconscious incompetence is very comfortable because you have no clue whatsoever. You walk around, you're like, hey, this cake I made, it's pretty good. People are throwing up, but that's their problem. <laughs> That's good, but say you're you're entering that uh, consciously I'm incompetent really not phase. I'm ask this question, am I? My my question for you is really: How can you, if you enter that phase at this conference, how would you handle that? Do you have any tips? Yes, yeah, yeah. Learn the grammar. Learn the language. Learn. Pay attention. Start to see what the difference is. Try try to understand. There's always a difference between good and bad. If you don't see it then you need to start figuring out what it is. Start paying attention. Look at how people behave. The medium of designers is behavior, right? What we do as designers is we change our users' behavior. And so look at what creates different behaviors. Don't just start blaming the users. Oh, that's dumb users. They, they don't understand what I created. That's a consciously incompetent thing to say, right? Unconsciously incompetent thing to say is that it's the user's fault. It's our fault. We are making that problem. And therefore, we need to uh, focus on making sure that the users have uh, uh, what they need to become delighted and not frustrated. So look for those things. Great. So pay attention to that today, too. Yes, um, absolutely. Okay. Now, just one final question. What are you yourself looking forward to today? What am I looking forward to yeah. today? Oh, I'm looking forward. To, uh, uh, I had the, the, the honor of, of sitting at a table last night with a lot of really bright people who are much smarter than I am who uh, are doing some, some really interesting things, and I can't wait to hear about all the uh, stuff that they're working on because that's going to make me smarter. That's going to be in my stand-up tomorrow. That's what I will report that I have learned. <laughs> oh, that's a great ambition. So, yeah, I'm also looking forward to all of that. Thank you so much, Jared. Before, Thank you. Before uh, we give you a big applause, I would also like to give you a gift because that's oh. something we do here in Sweden. Apparently, it's not like at every U.S. conference. No. But here, of course, no, we have some gifts for you. the U.S. conferences, they just, they're like, okay, you're done. <laughs> you're gone. Bye. Get off stage. But here, we actually acknowledge uh, the great work you've done here. And as a token of our appreciation... While they steal my hardware. First is... <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're up to. <laughs> Pay attention to the gifts. <laughs> this, don't they do this in New York. <laughs> this is what they do in New York. <laughs> so we have first a book about Sweden, actually. Sweden Just Amazing, it's called. Oh, and it's awesome. about uh, putting ideas and innovations on the map. So hopefully there will be something here to surprise or delight you. Or I'm hoping something there's new about apple Sweden. cake in there. <laughs> <laughs> Kanelbulle, definitely. Yes. <laughs> Secondly, uh, on behalf uh, of all our speakers today, um, we will also be donating money to Plan International, and this will give 100 girls the ability to learn how to read. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.